the introduction. Yeah. Okay, got it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first session of Notes from Immediate Irreality by Will Scarlett. Returned from a hospital bed on the outskirts of Romania, Max Bletcher's adventure in immediate irreality is a knot from another world. One that becomes ours, although it has taken almost 90 years to reach us. The immediate reality that the text emerges from and that is intensified through the through its descriptions remains there for us to inhabit and expand upon. This seminar explores variations on the unique fusion of presence and the projection that opens a space of immediate reality, both immediately perceptible to the senses and moving beyond the presumed limits of the real. We will trace passes into the hallucinatory, the virtual, the elemental, the animal, and the spiritual in order to seek out and intensify their stirrings. And we will do so specific, especially through perhaps the most humble, ubiquitous, and least likely medium the knot, while knots, written, voiced, sounded, sketched, imaged, performed, implied distance, separation, boundaries, and abbreviations. They also depend on unspoken affinities and are carried by open-ended and shared ephemerality. Knots from immediate irreality are evocation from elsewhere, inviting us to enter a space of collective fascination where our outlines and those of the world begins to blur. Our instructor, Will Scarlett, is a PhD candidate in anthropology at the New School for Social Research. His project, being there and not there, explores in interactions between the senses and their surrounding that generate experiences of presence in the environment, such as by virtual reality, the forest, the city, and the ocean. His writing include Utopias of Surface Public Sem Seminar, Inverting the Image Sphere, New Writing, Moment Lab, Future Studies, and Swimming, Indigenous Resistance in Digital Age. He has taught courses at the new school titled Presence, Sign I, Techniques of the Body and the Sensory World, and has presented at the new school the experimental virtual environments for neuroscience and technology lab in Barcelona and the Venice Architecture Binali. Phil, can you take the floor now? Yeah, thank you Ankur for that introduction and thanks everyone for being here. It's great to see you and um, after this lecture we will get to introduce ourselves. I'm looking forward to that but first I'm going to introduce Max Bletcher. Uh, so let's see if I can share my screen. Okay, can everyone see the uh, the shared screen? Yeah. Thank you, great. All right, so this is Max Bletcher. Everything I did before falling ill had for me a certain well-defined meaning in life. Uh, Bill? Yeah. What's up? Uh, the half portion of the screen is cropped. 
What's that? Maybe shift it towards right. A bit. Yes. Great. Oh, is that better? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay. Here we go. Max Fletcher. Everything I did before falling ill had for me a certain well-defined meaning in life that placed my everyday actions on the web of a vast picture whose outline and subject were bound to appear in the end. I know now that there is no web, no outline, no subject, and that the deeds of my life take place randomly in a world too that is ordinary. So that quotes on the darker side not fully representative of Bletcher's work, but it partially is. And I think it's a powerful image. Uh, Bletcher was born in 1909 in Northeast Romania in a Jewish family of glass merchants. He studied medicine in Paris. And in 1928, at age 19, he was diagnosed with spinal tuberculosis. And I think that's him lying in the middle. From then he became a professional of disease, as he calls it, traveling to sanatoria in France, Switzerland, and Romania. He was confined to bed, he could barely walk, and he wrote with a crate resting on his lap. He wrote the books, The Transparent Body in 1934, which was a short book of poems, Adventures in Immediate Irreality in 1936, which we'll talk about today, Scarred Hearts in 1937, which was a fictional account of sanatorium life um, that's also been made into a movie recently, and The Lighted Burrow, which didn't come out until 1971 because Bletcher's books were banned at that time until the 70s. Um, he contributed to Andre Breton's Surrealist Literary Journal. And if anyone here has taken Jason Mohagic's class on Le Grand Jew, um, you'll know Roger Gilbert Lecomte also writes about irreality as an alternative concept to surrealism. I'm not sure if there's a direct connection there, but it's interesting to imagine. Bletcher eventually returned to his hometown of Romania and died at the age of 28. Um, soon afterwards, his books were banned by the fascist regime and then afterwards, they were also banned by the communist dictatorship. And yet, luckily, somehow we still have them. So now I'm going to discuss his second book, Adventures in Immediate Irreality, from 1936, to explore the concept and experience of immediate irreality that inspired this class. Adventures in Immediate Irreality describes a series of crises that Bletcher experienced as a child. During these crises, he's overcome by intense sensations that correspond with a breakdown of the everyday reality of the small town where he lives. He experiences mundane places like his family's house, a garbage pile beside a river, an abandoned theater, and a muddy field as sites of sublime encounters with an irreality that totally absorbs him. Early on, he writes, once during a crisis, the sun sent a small cascade of rays onto the wall, like a golden artificial lake dappled with glittering waves. I also saw the corner of a bookcase of large leather-bound volumes behind glass. And in the end, these true-to-life details, perceived from the distance of my swoon, stupefied me and stunned me like a last gulp of chloroform. It was what was most humdrum and familiar in the objects that disturbed me most. The habit of being seen so many times must have worn out their thin skins, and they sometimes looked flayed and bloody to me, and alive, ineffably alive. Bletcher finds himself trapped in a per perpetual state of immediacy, without a fixed notion of reality that the people around him use to orient themselves. He writes, I had nothing to separate me from the world. Everything around me invaded from head to toe. My skin might as well have been a sieve. The attention I paid to my surroundings, nebulous though it was, was not simply an act of will. The world, as is its nature, sank its tentacles into me. 
I was penetrated by the Hydra's myriad arms. Exasperating as it was, I was forced to admit that I lived in the world I saw around me. There was nothing for it. But rather than grounding him in a coherent external world, this immediacy reveals a phantasmagoria of irrealities beyond his control. Bletcher's discovery that reality is composed of multiple interacting, coagulating, and dissolving irrealities allows him to move between them, or more often be violently tossed around by them. Some of the irrealities he encounters merge together to further mystify and dazzle with bizarre and often disturbing sensations and events. Others dominate and enclose the boundaries of the real, attempting to become the prevailing reality at the expense of all others. Sometimes Bletcher falls into an irreality seemingly centered around a person, but places have irrealities too, suggesting that irreality is not a purely subjective phenomenon. Unable to land in a reality that he can once and for all call his own, and at the same time refusing the ossification of the world that this would entail, Bletcher attempts to orient himself in perpetual flux through his adventures in immediate irreality. To do this, he suspends his knowledge and experience of the world in a state of radical ambiguity in order to- Excuse more... me, uh, William. But yeah. Sorry, really sorry to interrupt. We can't no see the text in the screen. That's okay. Right. Uh, there's no text to see right now. Okay. I'm just going to put the quotes up, but thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Unable to land in a reality that he can once and for all call his own, and at the same time refusing the ossification of the world that this would entail, Bletcher attempts to orient himself in perpetual flux through his adventures in immediate irreality. To do this, he suspends his knowledge and experience of the world in a state of radical ambiguity in order to more fully inhabit the swirling possibilities of the irreal. What he finds is that irreality isn't fully created by humans and isn't fully experienced by them either. The world itself generates irreality and living is already an act of participation in this process. But how can the world, the world that we also live in, have multiple coexisting irrealities that aren't purely subjective? We'll investigate this question around how immediate irreality works later on. Even though Bletcher mostly writes of events that happened in the past, he starts and ends the book with crises occurring at the time of his writing. This suggests that his adventures in immediate irreality continued throughout his life, and that the act of writing was an integral part of that exploration or affliction. Writing may have allowed him to orient himself and better understand the irreality he was immersed in, or maybe it further intensified his participation in it and allowed him to shape it in some way. Whatever writing did for him, it resulted in this concept and experience of immediate irreality being shared with us, at times even immersing us, bringing us and who knows what other irrealities into immediate contact. Yet Bletcher never positions himself as a creative individual wielding the powers of the irreal or intrepidly discovering a deeper, more dangerous truth. In the closing passage of the book, presumably writing from the all too immediate irreality of his hospital bed, he writes, whenever I return to these matters, trying in vain to fuse them with what I might call my person, when I revive them in my memory, an old man Weber's office suddenly becomes the room I am in, inhaling the musty odor of old ledgers, only to vanish in a flash and leave me to ponder the painful age old problem of how people spend their lives, living in rooms, for instance, or like strange bodies with the ramified fronds of a fern or the inconsistency of smoke, sniffing an unusual odor like the deeply enigmatic odor of mold. When people and events open and close within me like fans, when my hand attempts to write these strange and incompressible simple truths, then for an instant, like a man condemned to death, who unlike everyone surrounding him, has a quick glimpse of the death in store for him, and hopes that his struggle is unlike any other in the world 
and will lead to his release. I feel that one day an authentic new truth will emerge from all this, a truth warm and intimate, capable of summarizing me clearly, like a name, and striking an entirely new, unique note in me, and it will be the meaning of my life. Why else does this fluid, intimate yet hostile, proximate yet jealous of its freedom, persist in me, turning capriciously into the vision of Edda, into Paul Weber's hunched shoulders, or the over-precise detail of the tap in a hotel corridor? Why does the memory of Edda's last days revisit me with such clarity? Or why, to put it another way? And questions can go off chaotically in thousands of directions, as in a game we played as children, folding a piece of paper with an ink spot in the middle and leaning down heavily on it to make the ink spread, then opening it to find the most fantastic, never before imagined contortions of a design bizarre to begin with. Why, to put it, I repeat, in another way, does this memory come back to me and not another? Each memory, incomprehensible yet precise, demands my complete attention. Like a sharp pain, it pushes all minor inconveniences, the pillows lumping together, a pill's bitter taste into the background and encompassing all my doubts and worries demands my complete attention, petty and vague as it might be. For every memory is unique in the poorest sense of the word. It is only one in a linear series of events in my life, each with its precise character and lacking the possibility of change, of departing in the slightest from that precision. That is your life and nothing else, it says a statement replete with nostalgia for a world hermetically sealed as it is in its lights and colors from which no life is allowed to extract anything but the precise image of its banality, a statement redolent of the melancholy of being alone and limited in a world of solitude, pettiness, and aridity. There are nights when I awake from a terrible nightmare, my simplest and most frightening dream. I'm lying in a deep sleep in the bed I lay down in that evening. The setting and time are the same as the actual setting and time. If a nightmare begins at midnight, for instance, it places me in precisely the degree of darkness and silence reigning at that hour. I can see and feel my position. I know the bed and room I am sleeping in. My dream stretches like a fine skin over my body and over the state of my sleep at the moment. One might even say I am awake. I am awake though asleep and dreaming my wakefulness at the same moment I am dreaming my sleep. Suddenly I feel the sleep growing heavier, trying to drag me down. I would like to wake up, but it weighs heavy on my eyelids and hands. I dream that I am tossing, flailing, but it is stronger than I am. And after battling it for a while, I feel it tenacious taking hold. I begin to scream. I want to resist, want someone to awaken me. I slap myself as hard as I can. I am afraid sleep is going to drag me too far down, to a place from which there is no return. I beg for help, for someone to shake me awake. My last scream, the most powerful, finally rouses me. I am suddenly in my actual room, which is identical to the room in my dream and in the position I dreamed I was in while struggling with the nightmare. What I now see around me differs little from what I saw a second ago, but there is a feeling of authenticity in the air, about objects, about myself. It is like a sudden winter frost that magnifies the sound of things. What does the feeling of my reality consist of? That the life I shall live until my next dream has returned, Current memories and sorrows weigh heavily on me, and I wish to resist them, to avoid falling into their sleep, a sleep from which I might never return. Now I am struggling with reality. I scream, I beg to be awoken, to awaken into another life, my true life. True, it is broad daylight and I know where I am. I know I am alive, but there is something missing, as there was in my nightmare. I struggle, I scream, I flail. Who will awaken me? 
That precise reality around me is dragging me down, trying to sink me. Who will awaken me? It has always been like this. Always. Always. So this is another one of the darker passages where Bletcher uses descriptive techniques drawn from immediate irreality to voice his desperate antagonism toward the real, which is also at the same time an endless search for it. We could read Adventures in Immediate Irreality as a creative memoir of pathology and personal existential struggle, but we could also see it as a theorization of the world developed and communicated through attempts to live in various states of immediate irreality, as incoherent as they may seem. The book conveys this theory immediately through experience and offers clues about how to read it, or better yet, how to sense it as a series of experiences, which approach the question of what immediate irreality is and how it works, not to mention how to live in it. One of these clues is the ink spot game that Bletcher mentioned above. He wrote, questions can go off chaotically in thousands of directions, as in a game we played as children, folding a piece of paper with an ink spot in the middle and leaning down heavily on it to make the ink spread, then opening it to find the most fantastic, never before imagined contortions of a design bizarre to begin with. The world as mapped out by Bletcher's book resembles this ink spot game. The world is as precise as it is incomprehensible. Everything is what it is, immutably, but at the same time could turn out to be, or become, something completely different and unexpected. This oscillating contradiction runs through the book as a strange kind of metamorphic monism we'll discuss later. As in the Ink Spot game, Bletcher discovers the world to be composed by multiple simultaneous irrealities made from the same underlying substance. But these irrealities are not only a matter of interpretation or perspective. They're not just optical illusions or projections. In immediate irreality, the real, if we can call it that, is actually multiple. How is this possible? Fletcher gives us a second clue through another game he played as a child. It was like a game I used to play. I would make out a strange animal in the paint on my wall, and then one day I was unable to find it its place having been taken by a statue or a woman or a landscape composed of the same decorative elements. Like the classic gestalt image of the young and old woman, irrealities are present in the world as alternative configurations or constellations of the same elements. While it can be difficult to perceive both at once and the impression of one can overpower our ability to sense the other, as in Bletcher's game, both are actually there at the same time. For Bletcher, the world is full of such overlapping presences which affect people in similar ways, such as a window that for generations had induced the same imaginary voyage in his home's inhabitants. He writes, the walls of my alcove would seem to have harbored the dream of a carriage roaming the world. Another clue is gathered from one of Bletcher's favorite sources of irreality, the carnival. Bletcher considers the carnival as a kind of island or oasis where the irreal is allowed to reveal itself as such, and everyone shares his transfigured mode of experience for a while. Among the wax figures, photographs, mirrors, and movies that invoke an uncanny doubling of the world, Bletcher picks out the stereoscope as another model of irreal perception. He writes, it is like a stereoscopic slide in which the two images, separated by mistake, suddenly give the illusion of three-dimensionality once the projectionist brings them back together. Even outside the carnival, this fusing together of different elements into strange combinations that bring out freshly irreal stereoscopic depths is happening all around Bletcher. After his grandfather's passing and the deceased's brother is washing the corpse, Bletcher observes, so alike were the two brothers, one dead, the other rubbing, that they made a hallucinatory picture. In this book, as in this world, everything is one thing and another, and both at once, but not just two, everything is multiple. 
The realization that things both are and are not what they seem runs throughout adventures in immediate irreality. One of the most striking examples is when Bletcher is looking at an old painting he found in his grandfather's attic. He tells, one day I made an amazing discovery. What I had taken for watered down paint was nothing other than an accumulation of minuscule letters decipherable only with the aid of a magnifying glass. There was not a single pencil or brush stroke. It was a string of words telling the story of the king and queen. Now that the misunderstanding about the paint was cleared up, my admiration for the artist's skill was boundless. Indeed, I was embarrassed at having missed the work's essential quality the first time around and began to harbor grave doubts as to my ability to see anything at all. Having contemplated the drawings for years without discerning the very material from which they were wrought, was I not prey to so great a myopia as to misapprehend everything around me, misapprehend meanings inscribed in things, perhaps every bit as clearly as the letters that constituted the drawings? All at once the surfaces of things surrounding me took to shimmering strangely or turning vaguely opaque like curtains, which when lit from behind go from opaque to transparent and give a room a sudden depth. And for Bletcher, language itself has this stereoscopic quality of almost alchemical or perfumological fusions. Ordinary words lose their validity at certain depths of the soul. Here I am trying to give an exact description of my crises and all I can come up with are images. The magic word that might convey their essence would have to borrow from the essences of other aspects of life, distill a new scent from a judicious combination of them. It would have to contain something of the stupefaction I feel watching a person in reality and then following his gestures in a mirror of the instability accompanying the falls I have in my dreams and the subsequent unforgettable moment of fear whistling through my spinal cord or the transparent mist inhabited by the bizarre decors of crystal balls I have known. When we read Bletcher's words, like the words of many skilled writers, we somehow also experience a hallucinatory world that we're immersed in. Like the ink blots, the gestalt image, the stereoscopic slide, words are words, but they can also be images, thoughts, feelings, places, movements, and events. And so we have a description of the world performed by the book itself as multiple immediate irrealities interacting, overlaying, fusing together and falling apart. Bletcher writes from the midst of it, trying to orient himself and to immediately convey and open up this world further through words, images, sensations, creative synthesis. The book has 15 short chapters, so why didn't I ask you to read a few for today? Its overall effect is the irreal stereoscopic depths produced by the interactions of its chapters. And while the book, like the world it describes, isn't a coherent totality, the impressions of immediate irreality that are its actual content don't really appear from reading individual chapters. Bletcher's struggle against reality is also a struggle with coherence and totality. And the uncertainties, contradictions, and disappointments that accompany living outside of more stable forms of immediate irreality that people around him call the real. At one point, Bletcher comes face to face with the real through an encounter with his friend, Edda, whose perception of a red scarf, which Bletcher perceived instead to be red dahlias, turns out to be undeniably true. When Bletcher too begins to see the scarf rather than the flowers, Irreality itself becomes consolidated and diminished, and he's overcome with a desperate sense of futility and the claustrophobia of identity. In a world so precise, any initiative was superfluous, if not downright impossible. What made the blood pound in my head was that Etta could not be other than a woman with well-groomed hair, violet blue eyes, and a smile at the corner of her lips. What could I do with a precision so severe? How, for instance, could I make her understand that I am a tree? I would have had to send its giant magnificent crown 
with all its branches and leaves through the air using immaterial formless words. How might I have done that? But what does he mean that he is a tree? He means it in two senses, both of them literal. He is a tree because of an earlier encounter he had with the tree, which brought on a vivid becoming tree in his body. The more closely I observed the branches in its crown reaching out to infinity, the more I felt my flesh divide and let the fresh air from outside circulate through the spaces, and my blood, majestic and mixed with sap, rose in my veins, foaming from the percolation of the simple life. He is also a tree because, as the many metamorphoses in the book attest to, anything can become anything else, since in terms of its underlying substance, everything is the same. This ambiguous monism becomes most clear in Bletcher's description of mud. I stepped into the mud first with one foot, then with the other, my shoes sinking pleasantly into the viscous elastic slime. I was now one with it. I had sprouted from, gushed forth from that earth. Nor were the trees anything but coagulated mud fashioned of the earth's crust. Their color made that abundantly clear. And not only the trees, the houses too, and the people, the people above all, all mankind. The wasteland stretching all around me was my true flesh, stripped of clothing, stripped of muscle, stripped to the mud. Its dank elasticity and crude odor reached deep into my innards because deep down I wholly belonged to them. Only some purely accidental external features, the few gestures I am capable of, for example, or a fine gossamer-like hair on my head, or my moist glassy eyes separated me from its primordial immobility. But they were little, precious and little, in the face of the immense majesty of muck. Fletcher is just as much made of mud as a tree, a house, a person, an animal, a book, a muddy field as the world. And even his thoughts and sensations are nothing more than stirrings and bubblings in the mud. What kind of strange materialism is this in a world so profoundly moved and shaped by the currents of sensation and the imaginary? Mud, all matter, is a mysterious and intoxicating substance. Bletcher describes a world that engulfed me like a sea with petrified waves, brute matter in the deep heavy masses of earth, stone, sky, or water, or in its least understood forms, mirrors, paper flowers, painted statues, glass marbles with their enigmatic internal spirals. In Bletcher's favorite places, the waxworks, the carnival, the river, the attic, the forest, the funeral home, the precarity of the animate and the power of the seemingly inanimate is on full display. And perhaps matter in Bletcher's sense somehow isn't even bound within the forms of a physical body. Quote, in a few moments, the room filled with all sorts of curly cues, which though incorporeal, I had to push through to make my way to the door. Which brings us back to the question of immediate irreality and its relation to what may commonly be associated with the materially or objectively real. The answer, Bletcher writes, requires a lucidity more basic and profound than that of the brain. In other words, it requires immediacy. Immediate irreality, like the ethereal yet tangible substance it is composed of, seems to exist somewhere between the material and the immaterial, the embodied and the disembodied, the imaginary, the sensory, and whatever we might want to call the real. It is highly ambiguous, essentially so, and at times torturous ambiguity that Bletcher was stuck with, but that he also cultivated to more intensely participate in the world's ecstatic and deranged creativity. As his moments of crisis made abundantly clear, quote, the certitudes I lived by were separated from the world of incertitudes by only the flimsiest of membranes. 
like a single celled organism always on the verge of dissipating back into its fluid environment. Bletcher moved immin imminently through an unknown and unpredictable world, even though it was also the same town and often the same bed that he was bound to inhabit for most of his life. Here, Bletcher expands this irreal substance into one last hallucinatory bubble. I saw a picture of a wax casting of the inner ear in my anatomy book. Every canal, sinus, and cavity was filled in, forming a positive image. I cannot describe the impression that picture made on me. I all but fainted at the sight of it. In a flash, I divined that the world could exist in a reality more real than ours. A positive cavern structure where everything hollow would be filled in and the prevailing reliefs hollowed out into identical spaces completely devoid of content, like the strange, delicate fossils that reproduce the traces of a shell or leaf left over the ages to carve out the deep, fine imprint of its contours in stone. In such a world, we humans would no longer be fleshy, gaudy excrescences full of complex, putrescible organs. We would be pure voids floating like air bubbles in water through the warm, soft matter of the universe. Thanks everyone for listening. Anybody have any question? They can ask. Otherwise, we'll go to the introduction. Is it okay, Bill? Yeah, we can definitely uh, do questions now. We can also talk about it again later when we discuss the readings. Go ahead. Hi, Will. Hi. Thank you for that presentation. Hi. I, I was uh, I was curious about um, why were his books banned? Yeah, I guess they were first banned by the fascist regime in um, Romania because he was Jewish. And then after that, they were banned by the communist dictatorship because they were seen as being decadent and sort of pessimistic. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Oh, I can't hear you. Sorry. I had a small question with regards to uh, irreality itself, the concept of irreality. Uh, was it proposed by him? Uh, in sense, or was it developed uh, later on? And why is it called the reality uh, itself? It seems from his perspective, uh, it is more real than what might be considered real in the first place. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I feel like we can spend the whole class um, discussing it. He did propose that term. Uh, it's his term, immediate irreality. Um, and I mean, you, he was involved with surrealism, so it's interesting that he didn't choose to call it immediate surreality. He chose a different mm -hmm. term, immediate irreality, um, similarly to um, Gilbert Lecomte. Um, so I don't know exactly why that is. We can definitely explore and, and discuss and, and imagine. Um, but yeah, it is it is his term. And as far as I know, I don't I don't know where it came from before him. That's the first time I'd, I'd heard of it. Yeah, I think we'll definitely get into that. Thank you.
Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for that, Will. That was great. Um, I guess I'm wondering whether, um, just kind of thinking about the question that was raised there about the about whether, um, a reality is maybe a reference to the like more sensual world, and it's where he's writing from, but obviously has a sort of disconnect with, um. Um, yeah, that's, that was just kind of what came to my head, maybe as like a solution. Because I think it's, I think it's a great question, um, and there's maybe not like an obvious answer. Um, and I was also thinking very loosely about the fact that this is in translation and what that might mean for, I guess, because it's like a mediation between languages already, and like what that might mean in a book that's very much about like being up close to the world. Um, and I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Sorry, I've not got any further. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, again, this is something we can we can spend the whole class talking about for sure. Um, in terms of the translation, I think that's a great point. I um, I noticed that at least in terms of the title, um, I I don't know Romanian, but I tried to figure out what I could just using Google Translate, and it looked like what they translated as adventures in immediate irreality, that word adventures could actually be alternatively just events or sort of things that happened, um, stories or tales at the same time, almost like a, um, like a, a fable or something like that. Um, so there's already this kind of crossover between events and, and fables that's there in, in the Romanian language, I th from what I understand. And then for immediate irreality, there really wasn't a clear translation of those words. Hey, that's really interesting. Um, I guess, yeah, I wonder what the other like approximations could have been. Um, but then I don't know if anyone here speaks Romanian. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe we need to find Romanian. Yeah, that's interesting. So I guess that's such a like crucial phrase in, in the text, um, for sure. Has anyone uh, read Bletcher before? Or is anyone familiar with his work? Yeah, I just heard about him last year. I was curious how you came across his work, you know? Yeah, um, it was the book that I actually assigned the reading from. Uh, this week, which is called um, The Lighted Burrow. It came out with Sublunary Press last year, which is a press that I was familiar with. And so I just kind of heard about it. Also, um, I don't know if any of you know Dayan Lukic, but he sent me the link as something I should check out. And he was right. I loved it. What was it that, like, um like took you from like loving it as a text to wanting to do like a seminar on it was it like a question that you had to answer or something yeah that's a great question um i feel like i've been so wrapped up in planning the class for the past week or so that it's hard to like take that step back um but i feel like it's touching on something that's always interested me kind of going back to my original interest in just like literature in general and ex and my own ex sensory experience. Um, and it, it approaches it in such an original way, um, alternatively to the more kind of academic path that I've been following um, doing this PhD. So it was just kind of like an exciting other way to try to think about th these similar ideas um, in a more free way, I think.
because he has that even though you know he spent most of his life confined to, to his bed or or a carriage that he'd travel around in like he has this this like incredible freedom i think that he expresses in in his work yeah it's crazy it's like um it's so like full-blooded as well like full throttle like when he's talking about um everything being composed of like blood running it's, it feels so like in touch with the world and yeah it's kind of insane to think that he spent like what 10 years or something mobilized yeah i was also thinking about that passage where he's describing the world of blood beneath his skin right and um it is in in that series of passage that the immediate reality for me became the most complex um, concept because it was neither sensorial nor imaginative. And, you know, it was sort of dancing between the two. Like it was both of them coming together because th there were like multiple scalar operations happening, uh, which the senses could not perceive. But, you know, there's a certainty around their occurrences. So um, that it, it was almost the unveiling of the construction of an irreality. You know, that's what it felt in that passage. Yeah, definitely. I love that passage. And you're right, it's such an interesting blurring or crossing back and forth between kind of the imaginary and then just the intensely kind of physical. Oh, it looks like in the chat, some interesting alternative translations in different languages. Thank you. I have a somehow organizational maybe question or I don't know. Um, I saw that um, we're not assigned to read the full text like at any point of the seminar. Um, and I'm wondering, is it somehow expected though, or <laughs> what, what is uh, your strategy? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I didn't assign the, the book that is sort of like the centerpiece of the class. Um, I mean, I touched on it a little bit in the lecture. That's why I gave this lecture, trying to kind of give this, this sense of it without asking you to read the whole thing. Um, I just assigned shorter chapters for each week. Um, but I mean, feel free to to read it. I mean, I definitely highly recommend it. But um, yeah, I don't know. I I maybe it's kind of a joke that it's not being assigned at all. But um, it just felt to me like it made more sense to actually assign these other readings. And for Bletcher too, like the chapters that I assigned for this week, I think that they they like sort of stand alone better. Than adventures in immediate irreality, which you kind of, I think you kind of have to experience um, more holistically. And that would just be a lot of reading to ask people to do. But it's also just, I mean, I was just happy to be able to share those chapters from Delighted Burrow because to me, that's some of his best writing, those two chapters. So uh, I was a little curious about the medium he chooses to express this irreality being the written language, because as the examples you showed are visual art examples, and you have two image, images superposed in one, but in language, I, I find I struggle with this a lot too when I'm writing, because uh, even though we can interpret things in infinite number of ways the sign is always the same we cannot superimpose signs within them okay we have concrete poetry and everything from from more modern on this aspect but i was really really curious why he chose to write this, this immediate reality instead of using another medium yeah for sure that's a great question and i think that he he addresses it in different ways like giving those bizarre examples of a painting that actually turns out to be 
completely made of words um, or describing his his words that he can never find the right word to use as this kind of like fusion of sensations and experiences that happens through language. Um, does anyone else have any other thoughts on that? I guess he seems sometimes dissatisfied with with language as a medium. Like it's it's sort of it makes do or it's it works because he can then like compare it to a painting or an ink blot or whatever. But it, it's it's like the actual medium of writing is never can never find the one thing which conveys it. So there's all this like elusive all this energy, all these examples, and none of them are quite right or quite good enough. Um, so I think there's like I don't think he resolves that problem either. I guess. Um, I also felt that you know um, the way he's writing, it's almost words are words are making other words to come, as you know both words and worlds are making other worlds to come. Uh, also, because you know. He's, he's not using language to define something or to make sense of things. He's using language in a much more exploratory manner. And um, everything is shimmering. Like what, what he's describing is much more shimmering and, you know, wavy and light is moving in and out of it. You know, so it's, it's everything's partially visible and partially invisible at the same time. So... Uh, which is why even though it is it to me at least you know even though it was written language it did not feel like written language at all it felt like you watching the sunlight hit waves you know it it, it felt like that the experience of reading felt like that so there was something um at at some point of time i re i remember realizing that this entire page is one sentence you know, he, he, he's writing beautifully long sentences, something that when we take writing classes these days, we are strictly asked not to. I find very interesting what you're saying because it proposes that a writing more close to like a painting or, or something like that. When usually in poetry, we have more approximation with music. So we have this other kind of bridge being, being imposed in writing. So it's very, very interesting. Does anyone have any thoughts on how um, maybe he could have used a different medium, what that might have been like, or how one of us could use a different medium? Like maybe withdrawing? I think drawing has similar aspect to this uh, improvisation and continuation a little bit like like uh, what we heard but that's definitely something that i think is interesting i mean now uh, um reading his um his work is like I don't think he could have chosen any other medium, actually. It felt like that writing is like solely his, you know, that writing is just mine, you know, he is my world. And, um, and he embraced that fully, you know, 
uh, and um, I don't know. Yeah, just felt like that. I think. I I don't think uh, there's an answer to tell you exactly. I I not, I'm answering the question in any sense, but but I have thought upon uh, the relationship of uh, artists have towards their skill. Because in a way, uh, to, to learn any skill, we require a lot of discipline. And there is this some truth to a stereotypical artist not being very disciplined in that sense. Um, but to learn any skill, you require the discipline. An artist still manages, manages to master a skill in a certain sense, be it of writing or of drawing or painting or of music or whatsoever skill of expression and impressing the audience, uh, it, 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 it happens to be. Um, but uh, there, is, there is a certain uh, nuanced relationship to a particular skill. It, it, is, uh, it is not arbitrary also that it could be any other skill, but there is something um, really, um, I don't know. <laughs> I am not finding the right adjective, the right relationship that they have towards this skill. Miller, in the sense, uh, wrote upon writing. Um, that's one of uh, what I read. And uh, he, he, he had a very disciplined form of writing. But then his work does not reflect that form of discipline. What he writes does not have that form of structure or order that, that he says that developing writing would require. So, uh, I don't know where that comes from, how that correlates together. Also like this brings us to this question of like, if somebody have just felt it and the same person don't have any words and there's a pure silence, is he a less quiet of or a more of a point. If there is no medium in in, in individual and, and the the same sensation was one goes through. Yeah, I think that raises the question of like, what is the role of actual kind of artistic creation or something like that for Bletcher? Like, is he having these experiences and he would have had them the same either way? And then he tries to evoke them through his through his writing and share them with us? Or is there, I don't know, is there some actual direct relationship between his creativity and the experiences that he's having? It does seem quite urgent or quite necessary. Um, I think for sure, and I think maybe that's related to how, like, intensely the words kind of flow in the page. I guess you to mention the like page-long sentence and stuff like that. There's a sense of like having to like undam something. Um, yeah, I think so. Anyway, like, I don't maybe it's like not so straightforward, but it. And I guess it's maybe like kind of often said that like we'll have to write or have to do a certain thing, but it doesn't seem like a neutral relationship between the experiences and the act of writing. Yeah, Ankur's question was interesting. It reminded me of, uh, again, uh, Miller in one sense, but Foucault also said this in a different manner. They talked about uh, to make your life and art in that sense. Uh, and, uh, and one could wonder what that would mean, that would you not create art separately from, from what you live? Or if, let's say, if we take it literally and we say that 
living itself becomes an art every gesture that you do throughout the day all the time is an art um would you not create something called art uh or would how, how would that correlate art because art are usually art objects that are on a certain pedestal that sense it's not it's not ordinary um probably it is something to consider but if we also carry that thought further um in in bletcher's case his living conditions were already extraordinary right uh, he was not experiencing an ordinary life he was not experiencing an ordinary time um he was also uh, not like you know so there there's there's obviously what james pointed out there's an immediacy to his writing but there's also an intensity um which um which i believe also would have gotten exaggerated for him um confined to his bed and confined to his carriage and then you know um other forms of time behaving as they would while his experience of time was uh was was very different in that like you know it was much more concentrated and focused as we can see at least through his through his writing yeah um i feel like i do this every time in the past for shita which is just like agree with uh, me shortly afterwards um <laughs> but for sure and i think um like in going back to the the blood passage again um there's kind of a sense of like not of the art making the life or like the life that coming up but he's taking this like yeah like being so sort of stranded in a hospital bed and like not really being able to experience anything but the blood flowing in his veins and made it into like sublimated it in some some way i guess um which maybe is like a not quite in vision of what you're saying pretty but i think she just totally right that like the the conditions that he's writing from aren't every day for sure and like you can feel that Yes, that that is interesting to consider as an idea. But just saying, in in a sense, if we replicate that particular scenario onto multiple others who probably do not have the skill of writing, um, or in any or any other medium of expression, if you may call that, um, how 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 does the artist condition in general would relate? it may be not ordinary to to us as in different we being in different ordinary circumstances but since they have been in those circumstances would they perceive wouldn't they perceive their circumstance as being ordinary for them in a certain sense i probably probably when bletcher mentions of those um, ink spots on the paper or uh, when he saw that women um coming and he noticed the do not um the precise details of the do not this call it uh, he noticed them in an extraordinary manner um it wasn't those those sites were ordinary but in general but were extraordinary to him um there is something to his perception of ordinary uh, which is which forms expression in in the medium um this still does not say anything about the relationship between the artist and the uh, but the artist and perception Yeah, it reminds me of that part where he's describing his experience of pain. And I mean, the intensity of his experience of pain, I think, is extraordinary. 
um, and his ability to convey it to us a bit as well. But it also seems like when he's describing um, focusing on the pain, it's such an intense um, passage. Let me see if I can find it. But he describes it as like his his way of dealing with the pain is this intense focus on it. Um, yeah, so this is starting on page 91 and going on to 92. This is when he has to have some kind of antiseptic put directly into his wound and with no um, with no painkillers or anything. And it's it's excruciating. He says, this is how, when, for example, the pain would suddenly surge in my sick thigh. I put aside any reading, any conversation, and especially any inner thought, and began to follow its meanders in the abstract and dark space where they happened. It was like a stream of water that thrived there, hot in, in the thigh, and from it splashes and streams would part all over the place, like a game of fireworks. Then from time to time, a more intense pain was like a thickening of the gush and like a fan of stings in the flesh. I now knew the outline of the pain and all I had to do was, with my eyes closed, to follow it like a piece of music and try to listen cautiously to all the variations in tone and intensity of suffering and in the exact way in which I followed the modulations and diversities of a concert piece with the same returns and the same motifs that I discovered in the composition of pain, just like in the music I listened to. So somehow this intense focus gives him this experience of his suffering, but turns it into this kind of fantastic experience that he compares to fireworks to music, um, this sensation of pain, which itself is so hard to really define or, or give a kind of physical description of. In a way, I think you could take this um, passage to kind of, in a way, like articulate his entire method of, of writing or like, you know, some of the motivation that's behind it for him. For his entire life. Um, it, it, it reminded me of a, uh, it, it sounded very Buddhist in that sense, uh, but just, just apart from all the comparison that he makes, just focusing on your pains and just, fo just focusing on your pain and being one with it in that sense. Um, if you have to uh, not uh, be heated up when no fire is around, you have to sit in, in the midst of it. That's what, and that is what uh, the Buddhists say. But, but except that there is a lot of comparison. There's a, there's a majestification of that. They, uh, blood will bring something out of it, um, compared to the nothingness that the Buddhists maintain. So, um. So um, I, I agree with you, Pradeep, like even when I was reading, I, you know, came so close to that, oh, you know, this is so Buddhist in, you know, what he's saying by saying all these things. Um, but what I found uh, more interesting than the philosophical writings within Buddhism was the the tangibility and tactility, you know, it was almost as if how to get there. Like, you know, what does it mean to sit in the fire so that you're not burned? And that it means like this, you know, it means that you feel the blood flow and that you're able to experience it like the modulation as music. And, you know, just, just that it's, it's a revelation of the process which within Buddhism remains mystified. Whereas here it becomes very, very, you know, um, out there. Uh, it's, it's deeply personal and highly individual. Not everybody would feel it in the, not everybody would make sense of their pain in this same way. Um, but here we are uh, exposed to his way of doing it. 
and I, I was, you know, to that, I also thought this would be a good point of return to, Will, what you started us off with about how this book is also a theory of immediate irreality. And, you know, we have been sort of skirting around the idea of, because Bletcher is like one of those writers, you know, whose writing we can't talk about without talking about the way in which it is being written. You know, it's it's both the writing itself is its own method. Uh, and I was, because we have been talking about that, if we could also sort of share what you meant when you said theory of immediate irreality. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's definitely a big question. Um, one thing that, that I thought of as you were speaking is um, the way that Bletcher follows the pain in this example and writes about it and experiences it. I think um, it does sort of also trace the way that he writes in a way, like this sort of flowing movement of the sensations and um, the kind of flowing movement of his words that aren't really linear in the way you normally expect uh, a piece of writing to be experienced, but rather a piece of music or a drawing or some other form. Um, that has this strange kind of immaterial quality to it, but at the same time, it's so tangible, like the experience of pain, um, like any sensation, really, if you think about it. Um, but yeah, in terms of the theory of immediate irreality, I mean, that's uh, that's what I tried to express through through the lecture. It would be hard for me to um, to give a a good summary of it now, uh, just after having gone through that, but um, I think that the book kind of always performs what it describes in a way. It always tries to do what it is expressing at the same time, and the form always follows sort of um, that experience. Um, and yeah, I think in terms of unraveling what that would mean for a theory of immediate irreality is something that we should just keep thinking about and talking about throughout this class. Like I was wondering if someone who is not in their mid twenties, uh, not been diagnosed with an untreatable disease, uh, not having, you know, been sort of bereaved from a form of life that they were expecting that they'd live. You know, even what he describes that before I got sick, I knew that there was a web and, you know, that I fit in. And then, you know, then I realized that there was no web. And, you know, I, I was I, I was quite curious. And the reason I'm interested in the theory is also like, what if somebody did not have these intense experiences to root themselves? Um, does the irreality open up to them? Or that, that, does the opening up of an irreality necessitate the rupture of reality as you know it? Yeah, that's a really good question. And also what is sort of the role of a, of a theory? Does it have to be coherent or can the theory itself also contain this kind of rupture and this incoherence? Yeah. As, perhaps a more accurate way, whatever that would mean of describing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, does anyone else want to weigh in on that? It's a great question. Um, hi, I have some, some thoughts on that. Um, actually, some thoughts that um, regard the reading experience, like actually reading the text, and despite the um, the immediacy that we are discussing, and therefore the urgency um, and the fluidity, the, the flowing words and everything, the unfolding. For me, reading the text was um, kind of got me into um, a very slow diving in. Um, so he also speaks about like sinking, the way it's sinking. So I think that was my experience and I got to read even the most 
um, long sentences very slowly for some reason um, um, despite the urgency that some of the words might have or the how how charged they would be um, so I guess like um, like as a follow-up to Isita um, I was thinking that a person like I don't have this experience so for me I uh, attempted to enter um, immediate uh, irreality um, by going very slow and by um, you know I think like a, like a phrase uh, at a time um, a coma even at the time like I was I was really kind of um, looking at the the way he has positioned his um, syntax his syntax and his comas and um, where he chooses to kind of switch um, uh, adventures or events or incidents um, and then also the way um, he allows for the journal to be some form of rehearsal for what he feels so it's never a certain position it's more about you know, rehearsing the same image or experience again and again, perhaps for pages, like the 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 image of the blood that we were discussing, how the blood flows, and then also there is a very nice passage about um, kind of slowing down, which is the what he says, like as I write, um, so many things are happening in the world. I think he says something about an atom, but I don't remember the. Phrase. I might find it. Um, as I write, something happens in every atom of space. Uh, page eighty-two, and then he goes on into this circle about the you know the garden, a bird flew, and and so on. The wind blew, a leaf swayed, and um, I think he he really tries to catch our attention and uh, kind of say you know um, slow down and just observe what is happening and write it in the words that you have at that moment and you can revisit it somehow you can rehearse it again um if it makes sense but um i would really like to to read the whole book to see you know if there are some um revisits and so on yeah i guess that goes right back to the idea of a note as well like you know you're writing something to come back to you for later like absolutely um, and I think, I think that the like attention is really crucial. Like, um, yeah, like I guess like even just like as a like way to sort of access. I guess like we think of it with what Asita was saying in terms of like the sort of Buddhist approach um, of like focusing your body so you can experience hot coals or whatever. Um, but I think also maybe as a way of like getting into immediate reality. Um is by like focusing yourself so much on on the one thing. Um there's a quote from Simone Vail, which is something like attention is the purest form of prayer, or something like that. Um, which I think kind of plays in here. Um and I guess maybe going back to I think what Pradeep was saying, I think, about um, whether there's a way of, um, like, if you don't have, like, a mode of artistic expression, how can you then, like, do you have to necessarily be expressing yourself through writing or art or whatever? And I guess that, again, that attentiveness might be another way of doing that. It's just not um, so tangible. It's not so end result -y. Um, but yeah, I think that was really nice, to be honest. Um, well, you have to stay on this, or we should move to another reading. Uh, so we are getting out of time now. Yeah, if you have any comments over this, you can stay and ask. No, how much more time do we have? Uh, one hour left, so we we also have another text, no? Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, 
uh, I don't think we need to to be so strict about it. If anyone wants to bring up the Ronaldo Arenas text, feel free. Before we do that, I wanted to bring up this one passage in the second text from the Lighted Borough, the one about copying. Mm. I thought that was a fantastic portal into the immediate reality, you know, and what he writes that um, in, in the game called copying pictures that when not executed properly, when the paper moves a little during copying, the figures come out crooked and distorted. It is a surprisingly unique point of view of the insane for whom during the copying of life, reality shifts a few centimeters. And it came out of mind and produced completely extraordinary forms. And I thought that was so poetically, you know, like um, one of the most poetic descriptions of Glitch I have ever read, you know, read. Um, but it, 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 it behaves like a portal that, you know, a reality is come out from the shifting. So, um, for me, it also revealed, uh, a very, very diagrammatic thinking, you know, he, even, even when he's describing pain and fireworks, it's, you know, like the figure of the explosion is, is there. So, you know, those images are being, or even the shifting of, you know, you can immediately visualize two papers and two realities and, you know, something has shifted and something new has come out. And, and there's a, there's a highly performative diagrammatic way of thinking, writing. And this also, uh, when, during the lecture, you were discussing how um, one thing is always itself and not you know, at the same time. And everything is always multiple in the irreality. Um, so uh, for me that and this copying of life and the shifting of, you know, realities, all of that sort of came together. Yeah, that's a great image. And it's also a, ch a children's game again, like thinking back to the lecture, pretty much all the examples for his theorization of immediate irreality come from children's games. And I think that's really kind of intriguing um, images that he chose. I, I don't think it's a coincidence. And and yeah, like you said, I mean, this beautiful passage about um, completely extraordinary forms that are produced when the, the drawing gets a little off track. Every time Bletcher describes what he considers the real, it's always super depressing and like super dark. But then whenever he describes this kind of irreal or going off the track in some way, it's always this exquisite and fascinating alternative world that opens up. So I think that's kind of an intriguing um, contrast as well when thinking about how he might define irreality. And there's another part, I, I forgot where it is, but he says something like, um, like anyone who hasn't lost their mind a little bit is just missing something essential about the world. I don't know if that's an Adventures from Immediate Irreality or if that's from Delighted Burrow, but he says it explicitly. But again, it's not sort of a purely subjective experience that he's describing. He's saying you're missing something essential about the world. Well, I think. There's something that's disturbing me the whole time already because several times now we had been saying like he had this extraordinary experience, he's this extraordinary life, um, he's extraordinarily sick and that's why he's writing something extraordinarily, which I think is like, it's this really ordinary conception of the genius. <laughs> so it's kind of 
it's a boring description of how something extraordinarily comes to life. And even um, he himself, uh, in the first quote we had, he writes that um, there's no outline, no subject, and the deeds of my life take place randomly in a world that too is ordinary. So that his perception is not one that is placing him or his experience as, as something that is extraordinary, but I think that is something that is quite ordinary. The same thing with being kind of having the experience of being insane or being strange or weird, I think is quite an ordinary experience that all of us experience at one point or another in our life. Yeah, I really appreciate that intervention. I think that's a really important point. And I think it's absolutely true to say that for Bletcher, this was a totally ordinary, almost like undeniable, like inescapable aspect of, of everyday experience. Um, and, and for all of us, I think we can connect with that. But I'm curious, is there sort of like an alternative? Um, because, yeah, to to re to reproduce this this sort of figure of the genius or something, like what is there like an alternative way to describe this without falling into that kind of pattern? Um. Perhaps Glacier uh, himself uh, does that, explains us how do we do that by, by being absorbed in what is there, be it pain, be it the situation that you are in. Um, with the point about uh, the extraordinary being itself ordinary is, is very interesting that this is brought up because uh, probably it's not extraordinary as, as, we, will, uh, as we say it. But it's rather dissolved in each, in each individual experience. It's it's very ordinary. It's always there. It keeps happening, but one continuously dissolves it, depresses it in one form or the other. But uh, never it becomes one with it, or never gets absorbed in it. Never, as he says, uh, closes 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 one one's own eyes and become um, sort of look look as though you're looking beyond it into something else, which for him probably becomes that irreal dimension. Hmm. Yeah, it seems important to note that for him, for, for Bletcher, like the experience of immediate irreality always sort of entails this loss of self this kind of disintegration of, of self. Um, so it's certainly not about consolidating like a, a, a figure or an image of the self that's transcendent or anything like that. I mean, he compares himself to mud. He identifies with mud. It also felt that um irreality as a site is where you know the ordinary and extraordinary sort of get muddled by design you know like um th there is no telling what would be ordinary or extraordinary in that space um because something that is of the everyday um becomes enchanting you know when when he says that the sun comes crashing down into shards of crystal, right? Um, and and it like in in an expression like that, what is everyday and what is completely ordinary um, becomes something else. So um, in, in that sense, a reality. Um, also what you described in the course description, you know, the, the space of the elsewhere, um, where this linguistic 
distinctions are also sort of, you know, futile. I was just thinking of this quote I wrote in the chat because of what you said, because I really like um, the idea that if you think of um, reality and something that is not reality, you always have already kind of like a binary system. You always have like the one thing and its, and the, its exclusion somehow. And you can make this up with almost everything. But what you said about mud or, or, or about like, I think every heterogenic um, chemical um, product, so to say, is exactly that you have mixtures of things that cannot be separated anymore, but, that, but they not make up a third thing that is homogeneous again, but is kind of a problematic mixture that cannot be solved. Yeah, I think going back to the example of um, where he kind of directly confronts us with his friend, is this mysterious entity in the room a red scarf or red flowers? And he 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 exists in that space of uncertainty where it's both for a while. And then it's determined that actually it is a scarf. And then he can't deny it, it's a scarf. And then the moment is over. But there is that space where, where it's both, where it's multiple, where that mixture happens. I don't know if I go into too wild with that, but I have a sense that what pleasure is experiencing is like perception, not a, as a capturing of something, like not seeing seeing not as a capture of light into by the eye or something like that but perception as something that is happening it's happening like the movement of the objects like the colors of the objects everything is happening in the same space as ishita said so this perception that you the subject is a happening in this space put yourself in this ordinary position Lang was talking about. So for me, it's like this twist, like this this twist of perception, not not more as a capture, but as a process, of, as a uh, a movement in some sense, some sense. So uh, I don't know if this adds something to the discussion. But... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it helps explain why Bletcher wrote the way that he did, because the whole the whole writing can be thought of as that movement that you're describing, rather than a capture. Uh, I, I was also wondering about this, uh, the notion of reality and how, how it is also like imposed in a way. Uh, say, for instance, when Mr. mentioning about the color. So I, I, 
I was just triggered me to think about, say, for instance, uh, we think of uh, branch of a tree uh, as a brown of a color, but in uh, we see there are multiple layers onto it. It's not only brown, it sometimes turn out to be more green. And sometimes that brown has a reflection of uh, a blue over to that brown of a sky or a reflection of others onto it. And there's no perfect brown and there's no perfect scale in itself, no? So, so sort of like the space where something is existing or operating immediately affects what it is. Is that is that kind of what you're suggesting? Yes. This, this, also, this question of uh, when we fold this uh, uh, reality at the same time, the unfolding is all happening. Yeah, I also think that this raises the question of sort of like real reality status as a concept, um, rather than as sort of a naturalized thing that we're describing. Um, I mean, in a way, like you could trace the history of the concept of reality, like at some point it started being used as this sort of taken for granted external objective material space but then in other in other contexts there's plenty of other ways that reality might be described or there might be alternative concepts um, to using it um, I mean it reminds me of this quote from a philosopher of science Paul Feyerabend um, who wrote that um, like scientific truth is, is a concept in itself and is a value in a way. And if we find that scientific truth and freedom come into conflict with each other, we have a choice. We can choose truth or we can choose freedom. It doesn't have to be freedom, it could be anything really. But I think it's an intriguing perspective to take that the notion of reality or the notion of scientific truth is in a way a, a, con a concept um, and a value among many others with different effects. Yeah, um, I think uh, the distinction between um, GLTs uh, is, reminds me of the distinction which earlier Lacan made between real and reality where reality was given to one's own imaginary and symbolic uh, registers. And uh, the idea was it's very individual experience-based perception and real is something that cannot be spoken about. And then they lose sort of that and put reality into the real. And uh, what, what we made out of it was uh, there is the reality itself is based in the real. It's not apart from it, as Lacan was saying. Um, so the reality is within the reality um, in a delusion sense and therefore it always exists and therefore the immediacy and uh, urgency that it creates is always there it, it, it needs like a certain form of access which probably is you know in pleasure sense through observation or through a different mechanism that they might use in um, given their own context that they are in. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I was thinking that um, Fletcher's description of this kind of reservoir of reality 
it actually did remind me a little bit of Deleuze and the idea of the virtual as this kind of reservoir that exists outside of the actual, but actually does exist. Um, where is this? Yeah, it's on page uh, 77 to 78. Or maybe it's just on page 78. Um, he's talking about how everyone kind of draws this thread of life from this reservoir of light and dreams, um, from this maternal reservoir of reality, full of sceneries and events, full of life and dream. Um, all the events all the feelings, the thoughts, the dreams, which have not yet happened, and from which generations and generations of people will draw their necessary share of reality, dream, and madness, the immense dementia reservoir of the world from which so many dreamers will feed, the immense reverie reservoir of the world from which so many poets extract poems, and the immense reservoir of nocturnal dreams from which so many sleeping people will populate their terrors and their nightmares. It is the unknown repository of reality, brimming with tenebrae and surprises. So I think there are a lot of different ways that he describes this in a relationship between irreality and the real throughout his work. Um, and I think, you know, it's kind of up to us how we want to unravel it. I don't think there's really a clear, coherent structure underlying a lot of the things that he says, but I think it does evoke pretty interesting perspectives on what irreality could be. And I think it was thought out. I mean, I think he really did. There's an intuitive aspect to it, but I think there is also like, like his description of pain, uh, a careful attention to, to what he's describing. I don't think it's just all made up or something. I mean, but then again, you know, what's wrong with that? I guess in that excerpt, it seems like one of the first times where a reality is not connected with childhood and is instead connected, like this dementia reservoir, um, feels, yeah, like um, a very different form of image. Even if, like, you can compare, like, the experience of dementia to, like, a second childhood or what have you, like, it's still, so, like, it seems so far like the experience of being a child and the experience of childhood even the fact that he's like a sort of teenager, I guess, in adventures. Like, it's, that seems really crucial to being able to access this. But um, yeah, this, is, this seems like the first time that like the, maybe like not exactly opposite, but something different is evoked. Um, I guess I'm just wondering more about that relationship between childhood and reality. Um, not as like a childhood, adulthood, reality, unreality, binary, but as a reality, as something like, I don't know, it, it feels like not as straightforward as a binary, a reality doesn't seem like a binary concept to reality, but um, yeah, childhood seems to have an important role to play in that. Um, so I just wondered if anyone had anything to kind of speak in that some more. It, uh... Yeah, sorry, Pradeep. Yeah, but no, no, you can't. Please, please no, uh, James, you reminded me of the first session of Jason's last class, The Child's Imagination, and um, where he proposed thinking of the child not as something which is causal to the adult, but, you know, um, the, the child as a form of alien intelligence and, you know, uh, as, as a subjectivity with the ability to craft their own worldviews, right? So um, 
what you were just talking reminded me of that that you know uh, the the ability to access childhood is also in some ways um the the desire to go back to these multiple worlds that were accessible through childhood and which then slowly sort of start to disappear as other intelligence takes over yeah i totally agree um i think that's that's really apt um and i guess maybe part of the urgency then in adventures is the sense of like diminishing returns from childhood or like um being aware of like being in a trans transitional phase to becoming an adult and um i suppose it's complicated it's the same with the films you watch for jason's that he wrote it as an adult but um there there does seem to be like a yeah an, an urgency which maybe connects to that yeah, no, that that question plagued throughout Jason's course as well. That you know, could like, could you, if if child, if being a child is having access to this form of intelligence and this subjectivity, then it has got nothing to do with be becoming an adult. You know, like, could you could you be a child? I mean, it's got nothing to do with age. It's got nothing to do with you know bodies or anything like that. Uh, being a child is having a worldview then the, the nostalgia that we associate with childhood and you know that uh, longing that we associate with childhood all, all sort of become mood point as well then. Yeah, I guess we forget as well that childhood, there's that um, like Sheila Myth Biostone essay. I can't remember what it's called. It's called something, something about the child. I'll put it in the chat. Um, but it's about the kind of construction of like modern childhood as we know it. Um, which is maybe like a couple of centuries old, Max. Like, um, it's not really like, it's not as like a fixed, stable category for sure. Um, so it's, yeah, it completely raises the option of being able to return to like find uh, like avenues to it or like alleyways or whatever. Um, so I think, Petit, were you going to say something? Yeah. Yeah, I, I enjoyed the discussion just in the of perhaps the question that Bletcher himself brings up. Why was it that particular impression of the ink uh, that left an impression on his mind and not any other? Um, what is it about, you know, these, these reality that was that, and it, at this instance, at every other instance, probably Bletcher perceived an irreality in, in reality, um, through through a misconception, through a different through the language and so on and so forth. But at this point, probably it was the instance that he discovered a reality sort of manifesting onto him, something that that could not be uh, predicted. Putting ink in the middle of a paper by folding it and then unfolding it to see what became. Um, this this probably just happened. And this happening by itself became a form of irreality being manifested. But this this irreality being manifested into his own perception or in the general consciousness. So what what is it about that that leaves an impression uh, so strong as as this is this becomes worth remembering? This gains a sort of value within one's own life that when one Things about nostalgia, such things come up. Or one, when one thinks about one's own childhood, such things come up rather than, as Freud would have put it, uh, probably. <laughs> hmm. I don't know. I feel like, in some way, it comes back to what Lane was saying about maybe trying to like not, um, like consider the genius or the sort of like extraordinary nature of things. I like there's, there's a sense that there's maybe not like those two that like warning and this are connected. Like I don't know. Maybe we're looking for something that can't be found. I don't know. Um but I guess people 
like in some ways that's what Chris was trying to figure out and he took like three volumes and still didn't get the answer like well, why these things suddenly come back to you it's like it kind of ha- it's like happening to you right um which I guess is another way of like taking you out of your body and taking you out of yourself and your subjectivity when this is like almost sort of impressed upon you Yeah, it also makes me think of how um, when Bletcher is describing his experience of illness, like he says, you know, many people live their lives according to certain structures um, that kind of give their life order and meaning in relation to the rest of the world around them and the people around them. Um, And he feels like his kind of just collapsed. And uh, I feel like we could say something similar here about the relationship with childhood where um let's see where is it it's important i think to yeah here it is on page 85 um before he was sick i was myself and it felt as if i was irreplaceable um more so in exercising my life i knew and learned certain habits and manifestations it could characterize me as a normal person and similar to those around me. I knew how to laugh in a comic situation because I was convinced then that the situation was amusing and tears came to my eyes unwillingly when I experienced physical pain or some moral suffering. They were precise manifestations that accompanied exact and acute feelings unfolding in the space of a day from the morning cafe au lait to reading the evening paper. I was a well-glued and constituted, a well-curdled and consistent self, with feelings that had names and reveries that could be narrated. Um, So, I mean, reminiscing about childhood could be considered to be one of these feelings, you know, that's very structured, very well-named, very well-narrated. And that's a certain relationship with what childhood could be. Um, And then Bletcher's describing his experience which is all these structures collapsing. Um, And he describes himself as a man who lives and understands nothing around him, a little confused, a little dizzy in the vortex of world events, without feelings, without pain, and without thrills. Um, I don't think that that's, you know, fully accurate to describe him, but um, I do think that it brings up a question that this, this kind of collapse may give him a different kind of relationship to memory um then the kind of you know reminiscing about childhood that could happen over a cafe au lait in the morning or reading the evening newspaper you know in his sense of what what that entails so i i do think that just you know in terms of childhood and in terms of pretty much every theme that emerges in this book um for Bletcher, there's this kind of collapse of, 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 of structures that happens that kind of allows for this immediacy to, hap- to happen um, of, of the irreal. Maybe it's too far to say that children also share in that, in that amorphousness or, or sense of collapse, but it's a possibility. I guess the... Like the cafe au lait and the newspaper are both like anchors in a way, in like the adult world. And maybe like, I guess maybe you can make the comparison to like, like imaginative games which children play, or like the sort of like, the way in which you can immerse yourself in it without having like the need to have that, that sort of real world, real time anchor. Um, I, th- I do think there's something in it. I guess, yeah, like, yeah, I do think so. Yeah, and it's interesting that children make those games themselves, or, you know, presumably, they make these structures for themselves to anchor themselves in the world, the ones that he's referencing. It's not something that's really imposed on them as much. It's a structure that they have have created. Maybe that's why he, he's so drawn to them. He's similarly making these structures for himself, where otherwise there just aren't. And they run up against the kind of prevailing structures of, you know, what he kind of describes in various places as the real. 
But then he also describes in other places the real as being this kind of like total nihilistic void of meaninglessness. So, I mean, that's one way to turn the concept of reality against itself, I think, in terms of undermining social structures that define themselves as the real. Is to say, actually, no, the reality is like complete meaninglessness, emptiness, desolation, which is what he does a lot. But maybe it's, you know, his way of, of just tearing down those structures because they've already kind of collapsed for him anyway, or like thumbing his nose at those structures or something. Well, meanwhile, he tries to create some, some of his own. Yeah, um, I think it reminds me of uh, what you said, just I conceptualized it as this just a position between um, a, a, a great pessimism of what is there and yet an inherent sort of not naive, but a, a major requirement and urgency of optimism and a strong sense of hope in a certain sense. And the only other author that, that I probably based on my own limited readings, <laughs> the only uh, author that I came across, and very surprisingly when I noticed it was Bukowski, uh, who, who had this, uh, he was a cynic par excellence in that sense. That's the first thing that you noticed about him. But then there's great hope at times when he writes. He wouldn't, for him, it's still worth a shot, uh, despite the way he has conceptualized his own um, life and the way he has portrayed it, there still seems to be a, a great sense of hope that he develops. And probably uh, not just him, probably someone like Nietzsche too in that sense, who, who wrote everything down just to let the, uh, the other come, the child, the third metamorphosis come in some sense. Um, Yeah, I think Ronaldo Arenas is another great example of that. If anyone wants to bring in his letters. Especially the last two letters, I think. Uh, when I was first reading the uh, Antonin's uh, letters, I was surprised because they are really different from the uh, flesh of death, like in, in the style, actually. And it was okay, where are we going with that? <laughs> and but the, the two final letters get me really stricken when he, I, I don't know if I read correctly, but he's. To learn that to himself, right? Okay, so uh, okay, get this correct. So, because he creates this this character, this I don't Reynaldo, I believe, right? Who he talks to and to whom he described this fantasy lane, this fantasy in the good and bad sense he is in, and at the same time, at the same time, he's completely cut from this other part or maybe other way of speaking to himself that is right now. And I don't know the entirety of the novel to, to know exactly the sense of this, the, the character, but it's very sensitive in this sense of, of what happens when you, you are completely cut from the reality you believe it was mm -hmm. this experience of the exile of the of the of the one that is passed away and not received in 
in a good manner in this foreign land. So I I get it as this sense of irreality, but in a negative sense in a in certain way, like he's cast in this rea irreality, different from Blacher that is, is Blacher, Blanchard that is trying to grasp it. I I get by this the Arena's text. Yeah, for sure. You definitely get the sense that he would rather just be, you know, in the reality of the of the beach that he loves in Cuba, where but he says it's gone. All of it lost. He's in my he's in Miami. Everything is so dehumanized, so alien, so plastic, so monumental, so soulless. The mystery of a little grove of palm trees, a sheltered place in the sand. A hill, even a tiny little hill, on which you can stand and look out over a palm grove and feel the wind in your face. A dusty path winding down to the water's edge. A wild jasmine plant. The water so clear that you can see the bottom. A place where there's the chance of a chance meeting. And where there's a high sky and a street with sidewalks and doorways. All of that, all of it lost. I put up a Christmas tree this year, decorated it, painted the apartment, read some of my texts aloud to help me remember you, but nothing works. I reach out to touch, to touch and I can't touch myself. I don't exist and yet I suffer from my existence. I don't belong to this world, yet I know of course that the world I yearn for no longer exists. so much movement in that passage um, the the hill and the the jasmine plant and the water that you can see right to the bottom of it's that's really beautiful um i think i don't know if i have much more to say on it than than that i found that quite striking um there's this line at the end of the miami letter where he says to think of me as an infinite but always present absence um which also feels like it touches on something about the reality or um yeah this thing that can't quite be defined and and this is like the slight paradox of it i guess um yeah i mean um the letter is uh, reminded me of quote from i think the book uh meditations you know um think of something along along these lines like think of yourself as uh think of yourself um as dead you know and see what's left i think that kind of like the the letters carries the essence of that code basically Yeah, I think there's this sense that he is, if he exists at all, you know, it's sort of in the space between these letters, whatever space that is. Even though, meanwhile, he's, you know, experiencing the brutal reality all around him every day. I also just think in both Arenas and Bletcher, there's, there's this intense feeling of love, I think, that kind of comes across in the writing. You can just feel it in the writing, even if they're writing about horrifying things. There's this sense of fascination and love with the world.
I get it. That is uh, a sense of, sorry. Please go ahead. So uh, I sense there's a sense of love that came with this acceptance of the contradictions of the world or something. Some the the not how how can I say it? It's like the it's a, it's a love that came with destruction. I feel some way, and as we were talking about in the Renaissance letters, like this, the sense that. He exists only in these letters, and he is been destroyed in outside of them. So the it's, it's very strange sense to me that you can find the word in this artificial kind of existence of the writing, and I believe both arenas and Blechter. Uh, sorry, I, I get pretty confused with his name, but there is this sense that reality is an artificiality in some sense too, and to me, this is clo closely related to this kind of love you were talking about. Really, and I, I need to think about it a little more. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up because that was something that struck me too as I was reading these is the fact that they both just write about all their sufferings like they they include their sufferings so intensely in their writings they don't I mean they could have you know wrote written something else as a kind of like more of an escape you know but they they choose to include everything terrible that's happening to them and maybe even exaggerating it somehow to make it even more intense and more terrible in their writings. And I was wondering if anyone had any thoughts on why, why they chose to, to include, to include all these sufferings in their, in their, their writing, where, which they could do anything they wanted. I guess there's a sense that it's a way to, to transform it, you know, like, um, again, like of Bletcher, the fee, the blood and the mud and it becoming this sort of like um like world for him um and um with Arenas it's you know like he can kind of conjure these even like the simplest things like the street with a sidewalk and doors in it you know like he can place these there by writing about it which maybe again is like uh, a commonplace but I think, I guess, there's that sense of, like, making it, yeah, we, we being active within it, being, like, actually really building a world, not just writing something. Um, and it's interesting, too, how the things that they, they love so intensely are things like a street with stone doors in it and the pavement, like, um, or just, like, mud and trees. And, you know, it's not, like, extraordinary or like extra real things that they're searching for and it's not those things that they're championing you know um in a way it's it's like the the very like quotidian real everyday stuff that they um they're kind of fighting for or building or whatever one of the parameters of selection let's say of what they are writing about. If we assume that they deliberately choose to write about something, is is not whether it is, uh, is not categorically uh, present to them that it is something that I write about or fantasy that I write about or objects that, but specific object that I write about. But rather, uh, and what Deleuze would have called an intensity that, that they feel about something. So suffering, let's say, has that intensity. So does a strong memory has that intensity. And so does pain have that intensity, the physical pain that you feel have that intensity. And also the revelation of a reality uh, which happens by itself uh, 
confusing the scarf with something else or uh, the irreality manifesting as as the ink spots on a paper. You know, so it has that intensity. And probably intensity is their parameter. They, they look at what provides us the most intensity. And but probably that is what they like, and therefore they exaggerate it to its maximum potential. I guess if you know like suffering in that intensity, this is like maybe, but maybe if you know suffering in that intensity also means that you can um like work with that intensity or you can you can take that feeling that experience and make something of it um i don't know like um like the reason that they can write these um is because they have like an understanding um yeah of, of, of what it means to have like such an intense experience and then maybe you can translate that into actually maybe the experience of writing is as intense and as real and the world that they write is as intense and as real as the hardships or suffering which are experienced. Yes, that, that lands me to another thing that I noticed, which is the word precision being used multiple times this morning. To talk about things very precisely to, to sort of uh, precisely put something into words of such high intensity. Probably that's their task. Uh, that's lecturer's motivation in that sense. How do you communicate something which as much precision as possible, something that is so irreal and so intense? Um. Sorry for the interruption and like we are getting out of, out of the time now. Maybe now we can introduce ourselves. Uh, is it okay with you? Yeah, thanks, Ankur. That's a really good point. It's time yeah. that we introduce ourselves after we've been talking for <laughs> two hours. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. And I also wanted to go over the syllabus quickly just to make a couple notes of what we'll be working on in the next couple of weeks. Um, so just to get that out of the way, um, obviously, you know, two readings each week, you guys already know how to have a great discussion. So I don't need to give any instructions about that. It's been amazing so far. So thank you for that. Um, so next week, I would really appreciate it if everyone could just bring a note from immediate irreality that you found. So not one that you made yet, but one that you found. Um, and you know, this can be whatever you want. You can look at the class description if you want a little more focus. It doesn't have to be written. I mean, I found writings, but it can be whatever you want. Just something that fascinates you that you want to share. And um get, you know, get ready to present it to us next week in a short presentation, like a few minutes, three to five minutes or something. Um, and then we can talk about it. And if you wanna work in groups, that's totally fine too, but just organize that yourself over email or discord or whatever channels you want. Um, and then for the final class, um, then you'll bring a note from immediate irreality that you actually made. So see what you can do with the concept. Um, and if you feel like it, you can include a brief introduction, giving context or explaining how to engage with it. But the note from immediate irreality can really be anything you want. And then we'll present to each other briefly, you know, again, like a few minutes so that everyone has time. And then um, hopefully put, put them all on a Google Drive that we share so we can look at each other's work. And again, groups are fine. Um, and you can set that up on your own. So any questions about those two assignments? Great. And yeah, I mean, feel free to reach out to me as well. If you're gonna ask a question of whether you, 
or not you can do something? The answer is yes, you can. So I'm just going to answer that right now. <laughs> but feel free to reach out to me for anything else. And then, um, yeah, let's do introductions. So uh, I think yeah. James uh, is the first in my list. So the next start is next to me. Who did you say was the first in your list? Yeah. Me? Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Hi, um, I'm James. I am a study student on the Transdisciplinary Studies pipeline. Um, I am from Scotland, from the West Coast, and I'm based at the minute in Glasgow, um, occasionally back home on the West as well. Um, my background's mostly in humanities, in literature and classics, and I am not very good at introductions. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I guess this was a really fun session and I really enjoyed the reading so far. And yeah, looking forward to everything that comes in the next few weeks. Me? Yeah. Um, okay, so I, I'm Vitor, I'm from Brazil. I'm, I'm too in the transdisciplinary program. Uh, I also don't like these productions, but I, my background in, in psychology, actually, I, uh, I work with that. I study that, but I'm also a writer and trying to publish first book right now. And, and I find very, very, this seminar very, very interesting because we have to talk about a lot of literary work that I don't know if I get in a, a different time in New Center, but I don't find very, uh, a lot of, of seminars in literature. I think this is very, very, very nice. We're going to discuss Clarice, that is, of course, one of my favorite writers. And I think it's about that. I'm glad you're in the um, And I'm also in the Trump system where you the program. Sorry, Pradeep, we can't think... hear you properly. Yeah. Uh, you... Am I audible now? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I said that I'm from um, India. I have uh, a background in design. Um, I'm also enrolled in transdisciplinary studies as the team is introduced. Um, in, I have uh, enjoyed uh, the discussion up till now. I have enjoyed your presentation. Um, there's a great sense of uh, slowness as we read him, and uh, also calmness when you read him out loud as well. That's one of the things that I wanted to mention. Uh, so yes, thank you for taking this seminar. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ishita. I'm, I'm from India, too. Um, and um, I have to agree with Vitor that I was really excited to see a seminar grounded in literature. And so, so really enjoying that. Um, the course description well, like I, I felt as if the course description was written for me specifically. That's how close it hit home. Uh, all the right keywords to what I have been doing for the past couple of years. So um, I really enjoyed the reading. Um, reading for reading as reading, but also reading um, 
to learn a particular form of writing. So thank you for offering and I enjoyed meeting some of you again. It's great to be back in the same space. So yeah, looking forward to the upcoming sessions. Line. Yep. Hi. So I'm Lane. I'm currently based in Austria and studying computer music. Um. So I thought that's kind of an aerial practice. So <laughs> I might already uh, also read something about it. And yeah, here I am. You. You mean me? Right. Yeah. Me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hello, I'm I'm Gio. Um, I'm from the Philippines, and my I'm a filmmaker, and I'm also part of the uh, transdisciplinary transdisciplinary studies program here. And uh, yeah. So my 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 the works I'm developing are kind of like depressing me a lot these days, and I found this seminar to be like very uplifting and like very fresh ideas to like maybe to offer something to lighten up the mood in in my practice. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Theo, maybe you can name someone else. Uh, it's not your discourse. Yeah, we can Mar pass like Mar this too. Okay, Marco. Okay. Hello. Um, I'm also not very good at introductions, I think. <laughs> and uh, it's difficult to speak after reading Bletcher and Arena. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm in art and curatorial practice in the program and right now i'm in in budapest researching the hungarian avant-garde of the 60s and i'm very happy to be here and next week i'm going to a translator's residency where there's this romanian translator i'm going to ask about the title <laughs> Um, Marco, can you pass this to someone else so it's not yet spoken? Yeah, um, Leandra. Hi, I'm Leandra. I'm from Brazil. Uh, I'm in the transdisciplinary program he here as a certificate student. Um, I make some experimental music. Uh, I have a PhD in arts. Um, and now I'm I'm focusing more on my writing, and and I have some projects intertwining uh, fiction and theory, and I think uh, the transdisciplinary program is uh, here in New Center is a really good place to to do this. I think that's it. Um, Lai? <laughs> uh, Lai has already spoken. Isabel, Isabella? Hi, everyone. I'm Isabella. I am uh, Brazilian as well, currently oh, based what? in Paris. And um, I am a visual artist, painter, and I do also some installations. And I'm really interested in the seminar regarding expanding some of my writing approach to project descriptions or to ideas or how to navigate a conceptual side of the, the the things I create. Thanks.
Go ahead, I have to call someone. Is Michael Ho? Or, or Sabine? I believe Sabine Rose on the chat because that connection. Okay. Uh, Michael? Michelle, no? Or anybody who has not spoken yet, please. Jan? Just waiting, waiting to see if I will be saved from the introduction. <laughs> um, so yeah, hi everyone. It's like we haven't spoken for <laughs> like two hours, but yeah. Um, I'm I'm from Greece and I'm currently based in Athens. I'm an art historian, writer, and translator. Um, I've been since um, last October, I think, in the art and curatorial practice program. Um, but I have to say I feel most comfortable in transdisciplinary context. So, um, yeah, really glad to, to be in this course. I also, um, um, kind of what Ishita said, said resonates with me in the sense that uh, there were so many keywords and so many of the readings that um, really kind of stood out. And I was like, okay, this is something I would really like to do in August just to as a remedy against the, the heat wave here. <laughs> um, so yeah, looking forward to discussing with all of you and so, so happy to, to share this space. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ankur, I'm from India. Uh, I, I'm an art practitioner, so I studied in painting, uh, recently navigating my practices to uh, various mediums, film, photo book, and sometimes community-based. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Ankur, and thank everyone. Um, and please, uh, please bring your your note from immediate irreality that you found next week. And I'm really looking forward to it. See you then. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Take Bye. care. Thank you. Bye. So next week. Bye, bye, everyone.